morning or afternoon, depending on where you're at. My name is Robin Schrader, and today we are going to be talking about best practice coding guidelines for TBI. All right, so getting started. I have no disclosures. So the objectives today are to describe types of traumatic brain injury and the symptoms, recall injury mechanisms that most often cause traumatic brain injuries, recall coding strategies and rules for traumatic brain injury diagnosis, and recall coding strategies and rules for coding procedures related to treatment of traumatic brain injuries. So starting off with a little bit of a review of the head and skull anatomy. So two um, nice diagrams of your eight cranial bones, uh, and then um, a nice view of the um, inside of your brain there um, with all of the different parts. So something to refer to sometimes when you get um, a radiology or a physician's note and you're not quite sure what they're talking about, it's great to refer to um, a diagram to look at where those places are. So again, your uh, head cranial bones uh, being the frontal parietal, temporal, occipital, uh, the ethmoid, and the sphenoid. And again, um, looking at all of those uh, uh, gyri and sulci along with the different lobes, um, and then knowing that the cerebrum is that large part, the top of your head versus the cerebellum there, as you see, is kind of below uh, the uh, cerebrum and then your brain stem uh, there uh, going down into your spinal cord. So looking at types of TBI, since there are several different types of TBI, so there is a mild uh, TBI, which is usually a mild concussion. Uh, it's the most common type. Uh, brief alteration of con consciousness, so uh, that brief loss of consciousness less than 30 minutes. Um, again, uh, patients have maybe a dazed feeling. Um, you can experience confusion for about a day, and that GCS ranges uh, usually 13 to 15. So that's more of a mild traumatic brain injury. And you move into that moderate, moderate uh, traumatic brain inju injury, and that's associated with that loss of consciousness for over 30 minutes, but less than a day. Um, confusion can last up to a week, and that GCS is usually a 9 to a 12. And then severe TBI. So severe TBI, it doesn't have to be loss of consciousness for one full day, but um, usually it is. Typically, they have changes of the um, brain or the head on that CT or MR, MRI, and that GCS is usually a three through an eight. And we all know that that GCS of eight or below uh, indicates a coma. Other types of TBI, um, uncomplicated TBI, so the head and CT, uh, the head CT or the brain MRI are normal. Um, this can be mild, moderate, or severe, um, even though everything looks normal. Uh, complicated TBI, uh, the head CT and brain, uh, the head CT and the brain MRI show changes such as bleeding. So that's where you find those um, intraparenchymal hematomas, a subdural hematoma, uh, subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage. Um, any of those, uh, an epidural hematoma, obviously, those all are a little more complicated traumatic brain injury, right? Um, closed, so a closed TBI, so closed traumatic brain injury. Most traumatic brain injuries are closed. Obviously, there are open, but most are closed. Uh, this means an outside force caused a blow or a jolt to the head and does not penetrate the skull. And this can also cause that brain swelling, which we all know is a huge uh, problem and uh, definitely causes a more severe uh, brain injury when there is brain swelling. Open, mostly associated with a penetrating 
traumatic brain injury, but you could have a major car accident or something else where uh, you actually have open skull fractures uh, going right in there to the brain. Uh, we all, I think everyone, at least at a level one, I'm sure has probably seen those cases. But majority of them would be that penetrating. So bullet, knife, or something else that penetrates the skull and goes into the brain tissue. And then there are a few of the non-traumatic uh, types of TBI, which would be that hypoxic or anoxic brain injury, strokes, seizure events, near fatal drownings, and uh, the brain is deprived of oxygen and you have uh, cerebral hypoxia. So again, um, making sure that you know, your TBI is traumatic in order to code it for your uh, trauma patient. So causes and symptoms of TBI. So the top causes of TBI are falls in people older than 65 and children under 17. They are the uh, age group, the population that experience the most fall related traumatic brain injuries. So older than 65, under 17. So we all know uh, that the over 65, a lot of our patients are, are falls and uh, they hit their head. Um, a lot of them are on blood thinners, things like that. And that makes it then uh, more likely that they could have a TBI. Uh, your motor vehicle accidents. Obviously, motor vehicle accidents um, are, are uh, top cause of TBI. Uh, violence and abuse, so domestic violence, assaults, child abuse, shaken baby syndrome, all of those are uh, causes of TBI. Gunshot wounds, obviously, um, so uh, assaults, self-inflicted, um, a suicide attempt, and then you fall into that sports, recreation, and military. And we all know, I think we've all seen uh, the number of concussions associated with football, uh, but you can have them in every single sport, obviously, uh, colliding with other players, falls, and striking your head, um, things like that. So symptoms depend on the severity. So that key sign is that loss of consciousness after a blow to the head. So remember, um, when you have someone who has a thinkable episode, and um, they say they had a positive loss of consciousness, we don't know if the striking of the head, if they fall and they strike their head, uh, if that was the cause, or if you know they had that thinkable event and that was the cause of the loss of consciousness. So remember to be really careful when you're looking at a patient who had a positive loss of consciousness before the event. So uh, in order to code it as TBI, uh, you must have that, um, the loss of consciousness after striking their head, okay, not before. Again, uh, that seconds to minutes to long periods of time. So loss of consciousness can be a few seconds, a few minutes, um, you know, an hour, two hours, three hours. And I think we've all seen where it can be days even. Um, some do not uh, feel the severity of symptoms until they return to school or work. So. Uh, they may not feel how severe that concussion is. Uh, they get discharged, they go home, and they're told, hey, you're going to need to be off the next two weeks. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, watching TV or playing video games or all of those types of things. And people will start to do their normal things or try to go back to school, try to go back to work. And then boom, they can feel uh, the confusion and the tiredness and the headaches and all of those things that come with uh, TBI. So poor balance, tremors, uh, traumatic epilepsy. So seizures occurring after you've had a traumatic brain injury. And then again, looking at the symptoms um, uh, that commonly happen. So behavior and mood changes. So patients who have had a severe TBI, um, a lot of times have severe behavior and mood changes um, after. Confusion, memory problems, memory problems is a big one, convulsions and seizures, dilated pupils and blurred vision, dizziness, fatigue, headaches, nausea and vomiting, restlessness or agitation, 
sensitivity to light and smell, slurred speech, and sleeping too much or maybe too little. So those are all symptoms of, of TBI. And you'll see that obviously um, when you see that you have, especially I notice with uh, peds, especially after uh, football injuries, things like that, where they go home and then they come back into the ED with some of these uh, symptoms. So complications of traumatic brain injuries. So moderate or severe TBI can cause permanent brain damage and disability. So again, um, I think that most of us, especially if you're working in a level one or two center, have seen some moderate or severe TBI where uh, a person maybe is not quite the same as they were beforehand. Um, they have brain damage. Maybe they have problem with, uh, with balance. Maybe they have problems with speech, um, but there can be all kinds of uh, disabilities um, when you injure a certain part of your brain, right? Um, anxiety and depression, those are two um, large, large uh, complications of uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, brain bleed. So we talked a little bit, I mentioned about, you know, your brain bleeds. So, um, you know, chronic, uh, chronic brain bleeds, seizures, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. So um, that chronic traumatic encephalopathy um, or CTE, which I think uh, many people have heard about in the news, especially with your NFL football players. Um, and the sad part of that is that it cannot be diagnosed until that brain tissue is examined at an autopsy. So uh, you'll see a lot of these professional sports uh, players saying that they are going to donate their brain for this after their death um, so that they can do more studying on this particular uh, type of TBI. But this is from severe blows to the head over an extended period. So professional athletes obviously could be military um, who are at high risk for this. And this uh, CTE is a pretty severe complication. Um, that really has a lot of symptoms and you could read up on that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I think uh, there have been a lot of changes with um, concussions and they're, they need to continue to do that because of uh, all of these um, 70s and 80s players that ended up uh, having these uh, CTE complications. So diagnosis coding of TBI and head injuries. So what do we look for? So penetrating trauma. Uh, the first thing that you're gonna look for, well, what part of the head was involved, right? Was it the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brainstem? Was it more than one area? Okay, did it, did it enter the cerebrum and exit through the brainstem? And then remembering that um, you need to read, I, I cannot uh, talk about your AIS coding, but what I will say is, make sure that you read those boxes about where to code if more than one area is involved, okay? If one area is involved or more than one. Again, was there a loss of consciousness? Was it immediate, right on scene, immediately at the accident? How long was that? Was it not immediate, but then there was LOC and how long? So remembering immediate meaning the accident occurred, the the patient immediately lost consciousness and then for how long? Or was it not immediate? So somebody fell and hit their head, they stood up, they started walking away and then they passed out. There was LOC and now that LOC was for 30 minutes um, or the same with a car accident. So um, that's important to know if it was immediate versus not immediate, but then happened. And then remembering for coding of penetrating trauma, there are coding differences between AIS and ICD-10. Uh, for AIS, there is one penetrating code uh, for that penetrating injury to the head. And for ICD-10, in that, those guidelines, um, you may be coding more than one injury. All right, getting into DAI, diffuse axonal injury. So questions often come up about DAI. Do I code it? Don't I code it? Um, 
I cannot, again, talk about the AIS um, guidelines. However, I will tell you to definitely read them and that there are differences between the 2008 and the 2015. Uh, but what is DAI? So DAI, diffuse axonal injury, is a shearing or a tearing of the brain's long connecting nerve fibers, which are axons, that happen when the brain is injured as it shifts and rotates inside the skull. So it's widespread traumatic injury to those axons in the cerebral cortex, colossum, and brainstem. This usually causes coma and injury to many different parts of the brain. So coma, immediate, immediate loss of consciousness. So in order for DAI to be coded, uh, there needs to be immediate loss of consciousness. They can't lose conscious, gain, lose consciousness, gain consciousness, and then lose it again, right? Or they can't, you know, get out of their car and you know take a few steps, and then they and then they have the LOC, all right? Um, it has to be immediate. So if they fell, they had LOC after they hit their head, and they um, did not then gain consciousness or um, in a car accident, same thing. They lose it immediately. They have to be extricated because um, they have uh, loss of consciousness. So um, that coma is an altered state of consciousness that may be very deep so that no amount of stimulation will cause the patient to respond. And some may have a reduced state, so they may respond to painful stimulus. So that GCS less than or equal to eight is indicative of a coma. And that means without any types of sedatives or paralyzing medications. So without medications, they have a GCS less than or equal to eight. That is indicative of a coma, okay? Changes in the brain are often microscopic and they may not be evident on a CT or MRI scan. Now, usually when they're looking for that DAI, they are going to do an MRI scan. Um, but there are times when they may, it, they may be so microscopic that they can't even see it on an MRI. Um, mechanisms, so that high-speed motor vehicle collision, um, accelerating and decelerating motion. So high speed, you know, 80 miles an hour right into a pole or a tree, uh, head on with another vehicle where you have that, you're speeding and all of a sudden, boom, you stop. Um, falls from height. Blunt assault, so, you know, um, you get somebody who's pistol whipped or somebody who's, uh, you know, beat up with a bat, smashed in the head with a bat. And then for pediatrics, child abuse and shaking a child. Then you come into this grading of uh, DAI. Grade one is evidence of axonal damage in white matter of the cerebral hemispheres, including the corpus callosum, brainstem, and occasionally the cerebellum. That LOC for grade one is usually up to 24 hours, okay? Grade two, uh, focal lesion in the corpus callosum in addition to diffuse axonal damage, that LOC, that loss of consciousness is usually going to be greater than 24 hours. And then you have that grade three DAI, focal lesions in both the corpus callosum and brainstem. That loss of consciousness can last for months. So that's the kind of thing you're talking about. Usually when somebody uh, is in a some type of accident and uh, they have, they, they say someone's been in a coma for, you know, three months. Um, and that is usually what you're looking at if you have, not always, we never say always, right? So to code DAI, there are three things that have to be met. They have to have that immediate and prolonged loss of consciousness. So it must be immediate and the patient cannot gain consciousness within six hours of that incident. So again, like I said, they could have LOC and then gain consciousness, you know, 10 minutes later and then be out again and be out for the next 12 hours. That would not count. They must have immediate and prolonged, never regaining consciousness within six hours. They have to have that positive CT or MRI identifying that there is DAI present, okay? And then a physician documenting that the patient has DAI. 
if all three are not present, you cannot code DAI, okay? For ICD-10 CM coding, diffuse traumatic brain injury, and I did a little snippet there, um, S06.2X um, is diffuse, and you'll see axonal. So that is your diffuse axonal injury code. And then see your AIS book for coding. And again, I refer to uh, the large uh, page uh, that explains all of the AIS coding requirements for DAI. DAI is not a common occurrence. So just remember that um, it is definitely not common. All right, concussion and loss of consciousness. So. I think sometimes people um, definitely get confused about the coding of um, concussion and loss of consciousness. So first question that I often hear from people, can I code a concussion if the patient had a positive LOC and has a large forehead hematoma? No, you cannot code it unless, unless you have a physician, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant documenting concussion in the chart. So again, you have to have the word concussion documented as a diagnosis in order to code concussion. If a patient has other intracranial injuries, you are going to code those specific injuries. So example, if a patient has a subdural hematoma and the physician also says concussion, you would only code the subdural concussion would not be coded coded in addition to because the um, that that loss of consciousness is associated with that subdural that is the um, uh, that is actually the injury okay so again you don't code concussion in addition to another uh, head injury head bleed so code concussion with the duration of LOC or no LOC, okay? Um, so again, here's your coding for your ICD-10. So concussion is S06.0X, and then um, it'll follow depending upon what, what kind of um, LOC there is. So no LOC, so the, it stated the patient has no LOC, concussion with no loss of consciousness. There's your code S06.0X0, a. Okay. Brief loss of consciousness, S06.0x1a. Then you also have 30 minutes or less. 30 minutes or less and brief are considered the same for coding. So S06.0x1a. So again, um, if it says brief or it's 30, any, any amount of time less than 30 or 30 minutes or less, it's going to code all under that same code. Now with LOC, but status is unknown, this is a concussion not otherwise specified, is S06.0XAA. So it's a concussion, but we don't know anything else. Um, with LOC, an unspecified duration. So they say the patient had a loss of consciousness, but nobody gives you any type of time for that loss of consciousness. You would use that S06. And again, um, consulting through your um, AIS book as well, um, and any updates to the to the book uh, for coding of. Moving on to skull fractures. So the first thing that you want to think about is, well, what bones are fractured? So as we all know, we have a vault, so the top, and the base, so the bottom. And um, when we are coding our fractures, we all know that um, in AIS, you have that um, difference of what is a skull base, what is a skull vault. So just remembering that you're looking at all of your coding. You're not just coding uh, an uh, ICD-10 code and kind of, especially if you have tricodes or things like that, you wanna make sure that you are looking at both codes and that they are appropriate, appropriately coded, okay? So your skull base starts with S02.1, and the skull base in ICD-10 uh, includes the temporal bone, 
the orbital roof, which is S02.12, the occipital condyle, which is S02.11, and then your other fractures of the base of skull, which is S02.19. And that includes your sphenoid bone, the pterygoid plates, the ethmoid sinus, the frontal sinus, the middle fossa of the base of the skull, the posterior fossa of the base of the skull, and the anterior fossa of the base of the skull. So all of those fossas in the base of the skull fall under other fractures of the base of the skull, and the actual codes that you have for the base are the temporal, orbital, uh, roof, and the occipital condyle. Moving over to that full vault, so you have uh, closed S02.0XXA versus uh, open S02.0XXB, and the B for the open fracture. Remember that there are AIS differences here, so make sure that you are um, referring to both your ICD-10 and your um, and your AIS book. Pneumocephalus. So I often get questions about pneumocephalus as well. Pneumocephalus must be directly related to head trauma. Um, pneumocephalus uh, codes under the S06.899A. Point, uh, point um, which is uh, um, an other um, injury. Uh, and what is pneumocephalus? So pneumocephalus is presence of air in the cranial cavity. The symptoms of that are headache and altered consciousness. And how do we get pneumocephalus? Well, there's a couple of ways. So open vault fractures, uh, definitely. So an open fracture, um, a basal or skull fracture. So any base of the skull fracture, uh, you're obviously going to look for pneumocephalus as well as uh, cerebrospinal fluid leak, so a CSF leak, things like that uh, from the ears. Um, and then a cranial sinus fracture. Um, so again, um, those uh, are all associated with um, a patient having pneumocephalus. They may not, but, but they very well may also have pneumocephalus. There is an AIS code um, in the AIS book for pneumocephalus, but again, uh, it is not a code directly called pneumocephalus in ICD-10, but the code is S06.899A. Um, and treatment is usually non-operative for pneumocephalus. Uh, they usually elevate, elevate the head of the bed, um, neuro checks, obviously, and re repeat CT scans as well. Um, another thing to note is, uh, if a patient has, say, an epidural hematoma or a uh, subdural and neurosurgery goes in and does some type of intervention for that, after that intervention, you may see a CT scan that says the patient has pneumocephalus. That is not codable pneumocephalus because it was after that intervention and was caused by, obviously, uh, air getting in there uh, during that intervention. Okay, just remember that. All right, brain bleeds. So lots of brain bleeds to talk about. What part of the brain is involved? First, first part, what part's involved? Again, it's always looking at those different parts of the brain. And again, um, a, your AIS book is separated out into those parts as well. So what part is involved? The cerebrum. So, you know, the top part of your, of your skull, S06. 0.36, the cerebellum in the back here at the base, S0637, and then the brain stem. So midbrain pons and the medulla oblongata are those three parts of the brain stem. And that is S06.38, which is contusion, laceration, and hemorrhage of the brain stem. Contusion or laceration or hemorrhage of the brain stem or contusion and laceration and hemorrhage of the brainstem. So remember when you are coding uh, in ICD-10, the and or guideline. Hematoma or hemorrhage, uh, remember to code with or without LOC and duration if it's documented, okay? But remember to include that. The type of hematoma, so your epidural, and now remember you have those um, different layers of the dura mater and um, your epidural is S06.4X, 
and your subdural is S06.5X, all right? Uh, an intraparenchymal or an intracerebral uh, hematoma or hemorrhage. Uh, so you have uh, right and left for an intraparenchymal or intracerebral or an unspecified side. So right S06.34, left S06.35, and unspecified S06.36. And again, um, you know, read your notes in your AIS for where to code these uh, types of bleeds. Subarachnoid. So a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. So remember, patients, uh, intraparenchymal and subarachnoid uh, bleeds both fall with stroke. Uh, a hypertensive event, things like that. So make sure that when you are looking at your patients, especially for inclusion in your registry, that if that's what they have, that they in fact have a traumatic, and uh, I know our uh, neurosurgeons will write the lowercase t and then SAH, so traumatic uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so that's what you want to make sure that um, they are in fact traumatic. And I do query our physicians, our neurosurgeons, uh, regarding intraparenchymal or subarachnoid hemorrhages, um, times when there is a little bit of confusion as to, you know, did they have the event first, which caused them to fall? And so it's really not traumatic in nature. It was something else, whether it was hypertensive, um, a stroke, whatever the case may be. So if it is unclear for us, I definitely will query out my neurosurgeons to say, hey, was this traumatic or was this non-traumatic? Um, so if there's ever a question, definitely you would want to query them out. A few notes in this area are subdural hygroma. So a subdural hygroma is not a traumatic injury and should not be coded. A hygroma is a fluid collection. So sometimes patients who have had a uh, traumatic brain injury um, in the past, they've had a subdural hemorrhage, something like that. They may have subdural hygromas. They are not traumatic, non-traumatic. There is nowhere to code them and uh, they should not be coded, okay? Uh, mass effect and midline shift are the same thing. So if it says they have a subdural hemorrhage with mass effect um, versus saying they have midline shift from left to right, you know, 0 0.5 centimeters, those mean the same thing, okay? Tentorium, tentorial leaflets and peritentorial are all the same areas and they all code to the cerebrum, okay? So uh, you can see it written depending upon your radiologist uh, or even your institution. Uh, working at several institutions, I've seen it uh, referred to in different ways in by different radiologists. So again, tentorium, tentorial leaflets, peritentorial, all the same areas. Cerebral edema and swelling. So traumatic cerebral edema, S06.1, uh, there used to uh, not be a code, if uh, uh, remembering back to some of this, um, as some of you, there was a G code that was used year, uh, a couple of years ago, but finally ICD-10 has provided us a code, which is wonderful. So S06.1, remember to code with or without loss of consciousness and duration if known. Diffuse and or focal traumatic cerebral edema uh, would be coded here. Swelling in the brain cause, it causes that increase in intracranial pressure, okay? And you will see uh, treatment with mannitol, hypertonic saline, as well as ICP monitors, so those intracranial pressure monitors, um, inserted in more serious cases. So again, S06.1X. And again, um, just talking a little bit about um, when you see patients with a uh, traumatic head injury and you see them putting them on hy hypertonic saline and mannitol, um, that is your key to knowing that they have some cerebral edema, okay? All right, brain herniation. So again, this is a new code um, for, for us. That was a G code. Uh, so there are different types of brain herniation. I have a little diagram here showing a couple of the, um, the types of herniation. Now, again, uh, the only one that I, I didn't 
specify on here was that transcalvarial. So this is when that brain actually herniates outside. So most times where you'll see that is a patient goes in and has a craniectomy. Uh, neurosurgery takes them in for a craniectomy. And they'll say when they remove the skull bone, the brain swelled and herniated right through. Okay. And then they end up, they, they can't put anything back on, right? Because the brain is herniating through. Um, so that's that transcalvarial. It, it herniates through the bone, okay? Which obviously there either needs to be, there needs to be some type of uh, hole in the bone for that. Um, subfalcine. So talking about subfalcine uh, herniation. So this question comes up many, 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 many times. And I have discussed this with uh, neurosurgeons at three different uh, hospitals um, in three totally different time periods uh, to confirm each time. And this is not brain compression, okay? This does not compress the brain. It is the most common type of herniation. It is also known as midline shift. So subfalcine herniation is midline shift. There is no code to apply to this, okay? So subfalcine is a displacement of the cingulate gyrus from one hemisphere to the other, all right? It can compress the pericolossal arteries. And the most common thing that you would find from subfalcine herniation is stroke, not brain compression, okay? So again, subfalcine does not equal brain compression. Uh, what you may see if they have severe subfalcine herniation or severe midline shift is stroke more often than anything else. Transtentorial or uncal herniation, um, and this is S06.A. Transtentorial, you're looking for the cisterns to be obliterated or effaced, all right? Um, code first, the underlying traumatic brain injury. So again, if they have a subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hematoma, uh, or hemorrhage or hema what, you know, whatever they have, you're gonna code those first. You are then going to code uh, the um, increase. This occurs from, from that increased intracranial pressure. So the uncus and nearby structures slide downward across the tentorium. And the tentorium there is that fold of, um, fold of tissue that separates the cerebrum uh, from the cerebellum, just so you know what the tentorium is. Um, if you've ever had a college level AMP and you've done the cat dissection, you've seen that thin layer kind of looks like tissue paper um, when you go through and dissect that. And it is just that membrane that separates. Um, but this occurs because of that increased intracranial pressure, all right? And it compresses the brainstem. Obviously, we know when there is compression of the brainstem um, and herniation down that way, uh, usually death is inevitable. Uh, the cerebello, cerebellar consular herniation, again, S06.A, is movement of the cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magnum, and that also compresses the brainstem. So all uh, really important to uh, know and to make sure that you code any kind of um, brain herniation other than that subfalcine. But again, know that that is midline shift. Uh, the ICD-10 rule, once again, is code first, the underlying traumatic brain injury. So subdural, subarachnoid, focal, or diffuse brain injury would be coded first, and then the herniation. Now make sure that you are also following your AIS guidelines for uh, coding of uh, brain compression. Moving into some procedures for diagnosis and treatment of TBI. So the most common, I think we all know, are our CTs and MRIs. Um, so what I did was I just included some of the um, codes that we see most often, uh, procedures that are run for um, imaging. Um, and again, some of them have one blank and some have two. If they have one blank, it is that contrast quality, that contrast code 
uh, for you know no contrast, yes contrast, or the type of contrast, um, enhanced, unenhanced um, for those qualifiers. So again, um, a CT of the head, CT of the temporal bones, a CT of the brain, CT of the cerebral ventricle, uh, CT bilateral vertebral arteries, and CT of the intracranial arteries. And then an MRI of the head and an MRI of our intracranial arteries. Uh, more procedures for diagnosis and treatment. So um, an ICP, an intracranial pressure monitor. So there are different types of intracranial pressure monitors that are used. And if you are a TQIP participating center, then you know that we, um, that's one of our process measures or TBI is whether the patient had uh, an ICP placed and if they did, what kind did they have placed? So the most common that I have seen in 15 years is, uh, is a ventricular. So an intraventricular catheter slash an EVD, which would be an extraventricular drain. You can see it written both ways. And this is a drainage of the cerebral ventricle. So 009360Z. Um, you also would need to code the ICP monitoring. So the intracranial pressure, they are monitoring the intracranial pressure and that's 4A103BD. So you would code the insertion of that uh, drain um, and then also the ICP monitoring. And something that you'll see when you see um, an, uh, a ventricular drain place is you'll see them say, you know, uh, keep, you know pressure uh, above 20 pop. That means that they're going to drain it. If the, if the intracranial pressure gets to 20 or above, they're going to drain that to relieve pressure, okay? And the number could be 10, it can be whatever, whatever that number happens to be. But when you see after they place one of these monitors and you see them saying that, you know that there is a drain attached to that. Um, and it is um, draining that cerebral ventricle. Um, an intraparenchymal intracranial pressure monitor. So this is a monitor. There's no drain. An example of that is a Camino bolt, or you may see something um, called a bolt that they're putting in. Um, the insertion 00H032Z, and you also would code the ICP monitoring. So again, that intracranial pressure, 4A103BD. And then the intraparenchymal oxygen monitor, um, sometimes called the LICOX, at least um, all of the facilities I've worked at, we've used the LICOX. So that insertion is a monitor only. There is no drain attached to that, 00H032. 032Z. And here you want to code the cerebral oxygen monitoring, not the pressure. So the other two were pressure. This is oxygen. So it's 4A103RD. Okay. Decompression. So a decompression is to relieve uh, pressure on the brain. So you're releasing the pressure on the brain. Um, so you have a decompressive crani. Otomy, so otomy uh, meaning um, an incision. So 0 and 8000ZZ is a division. There's no drainage. All they're doing there is cutting the bone to allow more room for decompression. So um, they're just cutting that into that bone. So um, it may be, uh, you know, some burr holes, whatever it is that they are doing to relieve the pressure, but no bone is removed, okay, and no drain is put in there. All right, now we get into decompression, release of pressure in the brain, a craniectomy. So ectomy meaning removal of. So this is a removal of the bone without immediate replacement. Sometimes they do immediately replacement, so I should say with or without, so I apologize, I should fix that, with or without. Um, a lot of times, depending on how swollen that brain is, they are going to put that bone in the freezer and they're going to replace it later. So that craniectomy, remember, that is a complete removal of the bone. So you'll either see um, that they, uh, you know, they, they, they did that excision and they're not going to replace it. 
And in that case, you have zero NB, zero, zero, ZZ, and a decompression, that's a release, zero, zero, N, zero, zero, ZZ. Okay, so again, they are letting out that pressure, and that's where sometimes you'll see them say that the bone herni or the brain herniated right through where the bone was. Um, your evacuation of uh, head bleeds. So an epidural hematoma, again, is an extirpation. So taking or cutting out solid matter. So a hematoma is usually that gelatinous uh, solid matter that they're going to go in and get rid of. So that's why we use extirpation. Zero, zero, C, three, zero, Z, Z. The subdural hematoma, um, also extirpation, zero, zero, C, four, zero, Z, Z. Um, and you could be coding more, um, you could be coding several of these uh, for one op. So, you know, a right craniectomy for decompression with evacuation of subdural and a placement of an EVD for ICP. You're then going to be coding that craniectomy, um, which is that decompression, right? Um, the evacuation of the subdural, that extirpation, the placement of the extraventricular drain and the ICP monitor. So just remember um, when you have you know, TBI, you may be coding more, uh, more than one procedure often uh, when you have, um, you know, them going in and doing decompressive uh, surgery and evacuation of bleeds and then um, intracranial uh, monitoring of either pressure and or oxygen. All right, skull fracture procedure. So elevation of a skull bone. So um, you'll see this for depressed skull fractures. Uh, it's usually more than five millimeters or with that dural injury. So there's a dural tear, um, in which case you'll see them go in and um, elevate the skull bone and fix those, those dural injuries. So again, it starts with the zero and S and then dependent upon what bone, you know, um, if it's, uh, you know, most likely should be open, but um, looking at your, um, your other, codes. Um, so you want to add that body part, as I say here, skull, frontal bone, parietal bone, right or left, temporal bone, right or left, or occipital bone. So those are your body parts that you can choose from. Obviously, if you're not sure where, if they don't say and you're not sure what they did, you would use skull. You don't know the particular bone. Hopefully they let you know. Um, the approach, open versus percutaneous, et cetera. And then your device. Was there internal fixation, external fixation, or no fixation? And then obviously the qualifier is D. And then a replacement of the skull bone. So if they remove uh, a patient's skull bone for decompression and they put it back on later during that same hospital visit, you would end up having to code that op. And that would be a reposition. So again, ONS and then um, whatever that happened to be. So. Uh, both of those, an elevation or a replacement of that bone back on, uh, would both fall under the same. Quiz time, guys. All right. So what are the three types of TBI? Three types of TBI. All right. So we have uh, mild, severe, or critical. No LOC, brief LOC, LOC greater than 30 minutes mild, moderate, or severe, or none of the above. So what does everybody think? I'm gonna, even though I, I am actually not live because I am uh, out of town and I apologize for that, but um, let me give you guys a few minutes to decide if it's A, B, C, or D. So the answer here is C, mild, moderate, or severe. The three types of traumatic brain injuries are mild, moderate, or severe. And again, remember we talked about the um, let the loss of consciousness time and the other factors that fall into that. All right, number two. When coding uncal herniation, you should always code first the underlying traumatic brain injury. So is this true or is this false? When coding uncal herniation, you should always code first the underlying traumatic brain injury. And so we talked about this and I said it a couple times. The answer to that is true for those ICD-10 guidelines. Traumatic cerebral compression should be coded in addition to the underlying TBI. 
All right, number three. A craniotomy is the removal of the skull bone for replacement at a later time. So is this true or false? A craniotomy is the removal of the skull bone for replacement at a later time. The answer to this one is false. A craniectomy is the removal of skull bone. A craniotomy, well, ectomy is the surgical removing of something. Otomy is cutting or making an incision to a body part. So remember, otomy is cutting or making an incision, like a burr hole versus ectomy, removing something. So this was the surgical, uh, craniectomy would be the surgical removal of the skull bone, okay? All right, number four. If a doctor documents the diagnosis below, what injuries get coded? Concussion with free fellow C, subdural hematoma, 0 0.4 centimeters with brief LOC, open fracture of the left parietal bone. So what do you think? If a doctor documents that all three of these diagnoses, what injuries would get coded? Concussion with brief LOC, subdural with brief LOC, um, open fracture of the parietal bone. So A, all three get coded. B, only the subdural hematoma with brief LOC gets coded. The subdural with brief LOC and the open skull fracture get coded. Or only the concussion with LOC gets coded. So what does everybody think? All three, only the subdural and brief LOC. The subdural with brief LOC and that open skull fracture or just the concussion with LOC. So we talked about this as well. The answer is C. The subdural hematoma with free fellow C and the open fracture of the left parietal bone would be coded. Again, concussion would not get coded because the patient had the subdural hematoma. If we removed the subdural hematoma here and they had an open fracture of the left parietal bone and a concussion with free fellow C, you would then code both of those. Okay, but that subdural takes over for that concussion. All right, last one then. Number five, the brain stem consists of A, the midbrain, cerebellum, and pons, B, pons, medulla oblongata, spinal cord, C, midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata, or D, none of the above. The brain stem consists of the midbrain, cerebellum, and pons, pons, medulla oblongata, and spinal cord, midbrain, pons, and medulla ob oblongata, or none of the above? The answer is C. The brainstem consists of the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. Important to remember, <clears throat> excuse me, because when you're looking for that compression of the brainstem, it's, it's important to know when they give you midbrain pons or medulla oblongata with injuries there, you know how to code them and that they are part of the brainstem. All right, any questions, uh, certainly you can send them to me at robin.schrader at vcuhealth.org or you can text me anytime at 484-553-5972. I am always happy to uh, help out answering questions um, and to network with new people. I think it's uh, wonderful. So it has been a pleasure uh, providing this for you. And again, any questions, please let me know. Thank you.